Okay. Welcome everyone to PulpCon 2022. Uh, my name is Grant Ganey, and the, to start off the day today, my talk is going to be on deadlocks. Uh, the subtitle there, Fear and Loathing, is is definitely well meant, and you'll find out why as uh, we go on here. Uh, just the agenda for this talk, uh, brief introduction, something about the problem space, because some people know a lot about this and some people may not. Um, a little overview of Postgres locks, how to find out that you're suffering from a deadlock problem, some approaches to preventing deadlocks, some code examples, conclusions, and hopefully some time for Q&A. If you do have questions, feel free to ask over the course of the talk or at least write them down so we can get them out at the end. And uh, off we go. So first of all, who am I? I'm Grant Ganey. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. I've been at Red Hat for 16 years. Uh, what are we talking about in this talk? We are talking about Postgres database deadlocks that are experienced in the pulp application. Uh, what we are not talking about is application level locking issues, like Python locking issues. And we're also definitely not talking about a low level dive into how Postgres tables and locks and rows all work. So what's the problem space that we have here? Uh, I'm gonna go over what are deadlocks, whose fault are they, how do you deal with them, and why are they so hard to test for and so hard to fix? So first of all, this is an overview. This may be, Maybe everybody knows this, but I'm going to go over it because if you don't, none of the rest of this talk makes any sense. So what is a deadlock? Deadlock happens when two or more processes are wait, all waiting for somebody else to finish, and they all wait forever because none of them ever get what they need. And there are four requirements uh, for deadlocks to happen. First of all, you have to have mutual exclusion on resources. Something can only be held by one process at a time. This is why shared resources are nifty because everybody can share them. There's no chance for deadlock there. Second thing that's required is hold and wait. Once someone gets exclusive access to a thing, they have to keep it forever until they get everything else that they need. Third thing that has to happen is there's no preemption. Once someone is holding and waiting a lock, nobody can basically smack them in the back of the head and say, drop that and then pick it up later. And then the fourth thing that has to happen, and the most important one, is a circular weight. I have a fork and need a knife. You have the knife and you need the fork. Neither of us are giving up anything, so we starve. Um, the philosophical approach to this is known as the dining philosopher's problem. The link there is off to the Wikipedia page. And briefly, if we look at the, the picture that's here on the screen, we have five philosophers, A through E, and there's five forks numbered one through five. And all the philosophers are at the, uh, philo the Italian philosopher cafe. So they're all eating spaghetti. To eat spaghetti, they need to, each philosopher needs two forks. And because they're, they're polite about it, they're not going to fight over the forks. The philosophers have initially decided, you know, when I go to eat, I'm going to pick up the right fork first and then the left fork, and then I'm going to eat because that's where philosophers, we want to do things in an orderly, logical way. And the problem with that is if everybody reaches for their right fork first, so A grabs fork five, E grabs four, and so on, all the way up to B grabs fork one. Now A says, I need the left fork. Oh, wait, somebody's holding it, so I'll wait. B needs two and he's going to wait because that's held by C who needs three, which is held by D who needs and E wants four, which is held. And so everybody's going to wait with one fork. Nobody's going to eat and nobody's, everybody starves. This is bad. The fix to this is to, or is to have an ordering, not just I'm going to pick up the rightmost one, but rather each philosopher is going to pick up the lowest numbered fork first. So when A decides to eat, he's going to pick up one to his left. When B decides to eat, if he does it at the same time, he wants one and can't get it. So he's just going to wait and think philosophical problems for a while. C is going to start with two and so on all the way around to E, who's going to pick up four. At this point, both E and A are going to work on picking up the other fork. E, now that he has four, wants five. A has one, also wants five. One of them is going to win and eat. So one philosopher, let's say it's A, has both his forks, he eats, and then he puts them down. As soon as A puts down one, B can now pick up one, because that's the lower numbered one, and wait for two to be available. And it's so, so on around the table, and eventually everyone eats. So this is a, an example of order matters. You're going to hear that phrase a lot over the course of this conversation. Whose fault is a deadlock? This is the first rule. Deadlocks are application programming errors, always. It's not the fault of Postgres that you're locking. It's not the fault of Django, or you're deadlocking, rather. It's not the fault of Django that you're deadlocking. 
it's not the fact that your user of your application is doing something odd. It's the fault of the application. Every deadlock can be solved in code. You can decide not to fix it, it's often for good reasons, but that doesn't mean that your code is not in error. And I heard a beep. Somebody raise a hand. Uh, no, I just commented that the card wins. Sure, in that particular instance. Um, I wanted to I wanted to give that particular example before I went through the whole talk and lost my voice because, as we all know, you want to have a cart before the horse. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Okay, so deadlocks are, are our fault. So how do we deal with them? There are three basic ways to deal with deadlocks. One, the simplest, is simply to ignore them. Uh, now, the problem with that is if you don't have forced failure, you know, like in the philosopher's example, the whole system can back up and then nothing gets done until you restart. See the old tasking system in Pulp, and kudos to, again to everyone that created the new tasking system because the old tasking system ran into this kind of a problem at a Python level on a regular basis. Um, if there's a forced failure in, in play, for example, in Postgres, the database will notice when two transactions are deadlocked, the database will then shoot one of those processes. Uh, and so one of them works, everybody keeps moving, but somebody loses and dies. If we at the application level are ignoring that, that means that if there's two sinks happening, let's say a deadlock happens, one of the sinks is gonna fail with an error. At that point, the user of pulp has to reissue that sink to make it work. They're sad about that, we get sev one problems, and this is the thing that we'd like to avoid. A second approach to dealing with deadlocks is to detect them and then retry. When your code is doing a thing and gets shot in the head by because it, it ran into a deadlock, one thing you can do is simply, oh, I had a deadlock problem. I'm going to restart my task from its initial state. This is exciting because one, resetting to initial conditions can make your code really complicated because you might be in the middle of a large complicated sequence of events and you've done 80% of them and now you have to reset everything to the beginning. Another part of the problem is deadlocks aren't necessarily just two processes. There might be 10 or 20 processes that all want to have the same resources and your particular task might just be the one that loses every time. You don't know in advance how many times you're gonna have to retry. Uh, so detect and retry is a valid way to deal with deadlocks. It's it just brings uh, complications to your code. A third way to deal with deadlocks is to prevent them from happening. And that's the majority of what I'm gonna be talking about in this talk. It requires that your code be written to be aware of concurrency and to take steps to protect itself uh, and to protect the system from deadlocks happening. So why are deadlocks so hard to test for? Why do so often deadlocks are they found by our users instead of by developers or by our CI system or even by QE? So there's three problems here. One is deadlocks are very data dependent. If your data doesn't overlap, there's not a problem. I can sync 15 independent repos simultaneously and pull up all day, I will not see a deadlock. Second problem is deadlocks tend to be very timing window dependent. Often, especially in the, in, at the Python level, the code that's gonna be holding locks way down in the database, those locks are held for very short periods of time. Uh, we might be talking microseconds for a particular uh, transaction. Which doesn't mean you don't have the possibility for deadlock, it just means that as a developer, you're never gonna see it. You might have to go through that particular section of code hundreds of times under high concurrency before you hit it which means developers will never see it. QE will see it once and never reproduce it. And eight of your users will see it the day after you release your code. That's just the reality of, of software development. Uh, and the third part of the reason is uh, obviously deadlocks are very concurrency dependent. You have to get the data and the timing and a lot of concurrency all happening all at once in order to hit the window that will cause the deadlock to happen. Um, here's an example from this is an actual example that has affected Pulp 3 in the wild uh, and had multiple customer and user reports open against it. You want to do an immediate repository sync of five or more copies of the exact same repo. And this is a thing that happens a lot, by the way, in the Catello workflow. This is a main path case. They have to be syncing at the exact same time. The repos have to be large. 
tens of thousands of pieces of content apiece. And they have to be being synced into a pulp instance that has never seen any of that content before. If any one of these four things was not true, the, the deadlock didn't happen. This can be really fun to try and narrow down what your problem is as a dev when this is the only kind of recreator you have. Also, occasionally you would do this and it wouldn't deadlock. See data dependent and timing windows. So let's talk a little bit about Postgres and locks. I'm not going to spend a deep dive on this, but it is important to know uh, some of these details to be able to debug what's going on and then figure out how to fix it. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of different lock types in Postgres. Um, let's look at some of the gory details. This is the Postgres documentation I'm about to show. Here we are where we're talking about explicit locking. There are table and row and page level locks. There's, there is some advice about deadlocks in here. Um, and then there are things called advisory locks, which I'm not going to talk about. It is a thing that you can uh, build into your application. Um, I'm not going to talk about those. So if we talk about table level locks, you can see each of these each of these capitalized expressions here. That is a kind of lock. Access row share, row exclusive, share update exclusive, share, share row exclusive, exclusive, and access exclusive. Ta-da! There's a lot. And they interact with each other in complicated ways. That's for entire tables. At the row level, which is when you're updating a bunch of rows, you're inserting rows, that's a, that's a row level lock. Uh, rows can be locked for update, for no key update, for share, and for key share. Now, these also interact in interesting and complicated ways. We're not gonna spend, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time describing this process, but this, the documentation is out there. There is a ton of documentation on on dealing with locks way down deep at the database level. You're more than welcome to go read, read it up on it when you have time. One of the quotes from that document is, the best defense against deadlocks is generally to avoid them by being certain that all applications using a database acquire locks on multiple objects in a consistent order. Consistent ordering matters. So think back to the philosophers. The order was you pick up the lower numbered one and then the higher numbered one. And sorry, the lower numbered one first and then the, the other fork. Um, that's the ordering that really matters here. Um, at the Python level, you shouldn't know about the specific locks that the database is going to hold. Um, you should be ordering your objects for doing things like inserts, for doing things like updates, and then let the database do whatever the database is going to do. However, that rule has exceptions. There are times where it's actually important uh, or at least more straightforward and maintainable at the Python level to know, OK, in this instance, I know I need to get this kind of lock on all these rows, and I'm just going to do it. Um, that is an exception, but it is a thing that you may occasionally have to do. All right, briefly, table locks, what are they? You can put a lock on an entire table. That's an entire, if you think of it this way, it's an entire model in Django. Uh, it ruins the concurrency of entire data models. If I say I'm going to fix this deadlock by locking, for example, the content object, the core underscore content table in Postgres, that means nobody else gets to touch content objects except me until I'm done. Uh, this is just means all of our concurrency goes out the window. Um, it's a big hammer. Also, that can cause you to have worse deadlock problems if other parts of the application don't know that that's a possibility. So table locks are a really tempting, I just need to fix this and get a fix out by tomorrow. And if you're not careful, you will end up causing yourself way more trouble than you're hoping to fix. Row level locks are the, the normal, if you will, thing that's happening over the course of your application running uh, and doing things with uh, Python objects and inserting them into tables and deleting them and updating them uh, into the persistent storage. You're locking individual row or multiple rows in a table in a transaction. If the data doesn't overlap, there's no concurrency problem. So if I have 15 independent repositories that are all building content, all the rows that each repository is dealing with don't know about each other. It's only when there's overlapping content that you have a problem. Um, when you update rows in a table, 
that locks everything that's being updated if you're doing a bulk update. However, the, this is an important uh, note to take. In Postgres, updates happen in arbitrary order, which means you don't know what order Postgres is going to decide to lock each row individually as it goes. This is a big source of uh, uh, deadlock mines, if you will. Uh, there are ways you can say, I want to select these to be updated before you do that in a way that enforces the order at the SQL level, and that will avoid your deadlock. And you can do this from Django. We will see an example uh, later on in this talk because uh, we've used that to fix some of our deadlock problems. <sighs> All right, 15 minutes in, everybody take a breath. Okay, so how do you know you're having deadlock problems? One thing that you will not have, at, at least not in the current, uh, the current incarnation of Pulp and not with Postgres, is you will not have your system just slowly slowing down until everything is sitting waiting and nothing is running. And the reason for this is because Postgres detects deadlocks and picks one philosopher at the table and just shoots them in the head. And then everybody, that, that philosopher's forks drop the table and everybody else gets a chance to pick them up. So what will end up happening is you will have failed tasks in your pulp instance when you have a deadlock. If you look at the tasks error field, the phrase you will see, oddly enough, is deadlock detected. If you look at the journal control output, you will see that what the error output that ends up in the task, you'll see the deadlock detected warning and you'll see the trace back in your journal control output. The Postgres log will tell you the same. It will also or can also give you specifics about the SQL that is was running and why Postgres decided to shoot someone. Uh, so if you grep your journal control output or your Postgres logs for either deadlock detected or the phrase share lock, this, is ha this happens a lot, then you'll be able to see where the deadlock happened and start trying to debug what's going on in your application. Which log gives you the information you want? Obviously the task error message will give you, here's sorry, the description. Brent, go ahead. Yes, go I'm ahead. Sorry, we have a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you probably don't see the chat. So David no, is asking, no, I can't. How, how do the workers know which worker to kill when there is a deadlock? How do the workers know? The, the workers, workers don't know. Yeah. It's Post the database that just randomly decides. Postgres shoots a philosopher in the head. In this case, the philosophers are the, the connection. It, it severs the connection from the database. Yeah, yeah, and the the workers actually aren't being killed. It's the um, the workers executing across the SQL cursor, and it's the um, it's that it's actually this the this server side that it has its um, SQL execution killed. Yes. So Post Postgres is able to detect and kill the the pulp workers. Sort of. not the workers Correct. not the workers themselves the yes, worker the from the workers yeah from the workers perspective it was running a sql um interaction uh during a transaction and it experienced a fatal exception and the worker exactly right. does exception mm -hmm. handling which caused it to exit workers right. could also it wouldn't be smart uh, for all the reasons we're saying could just retry that would not be the good way to do it so the workers mm -hmm. being killed is a is an artifact of how the worker is handling the postgres um side exception Exactly right. And the, to to, clar to um, extend, not clarify, but to extend on on your comment, Brian. So yes, the worker is the process that, that's running. The task is the Python code that the worker is executing. The, wor the task gets its database connection cut. Postgres says, you don't get to talk to me anymore because you caused a deadlock and that's the fatal exception. The worker detects that. The worker, as you say, could be at that point, the worker code could say, oh, this task was killed because of a deadlock, because there's enough information to know that this was a deadlock problem. I'm just going to reissue the task. The problem is that the work that assumes that all tasks are item potent, which they may not be. They should be, but they may not be. So catching it at the worker level is dangerous. Um, the task itself knows, could know what it should do if it wants to retry. But that means every task now has to have retry logic. So that's why detecting and retrying makes things a lot more complicated in your code. It's valid, you can do it, but it does tend to make the code a lot more complicated. You have to think pretty hard about that. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Cool. 
Cool. And if I could ask folk to give like an audible response, just like that, because I can't see you on screen. So, you know, thumbs up or something I can't see, unfortunately. Okay. So you've, you've looked at your task and it failed and you looked at the task output and it said deadlock detected. Now, where are you going to look? So you can look in the Postgres logs, which will show you which DB processes are colliding. It can show you the exact SQL that was involved. And there is a, uh, a configuration you can set in Postgres called log statement equals all. You put that in your postgresworth.conf. And what that means is Postgres is now going to write every SQL query that hits it out into its log files. The log files will get quite large doing this. After you've hit a deadlock, if you can reproduce it, turning this on will tell you exactly what's, what SQL is involved, which can help you debug the problem. Postgres knows nothing about pulp tasks. It knows nothing about Python objects. It just knows I have a connection and there's a SQL request coming down over it and I'm going to shoot it in the head. Uh, so it's not going to tell you anything about Python. And there's a couple of places to look for logs. If you're on Fedora, your logs for Postgres tend to be in var lib, PG SQL, data, log. And then there's a log for each day. This DDD is like capital THU for Thursday. Uh, we'll see these a little later in the presentation. If you're on RHEL, well, specifically, I got this from this is if you're on RHEL on a system that has uh, satellite slash Catello installed, then you're going to find the logs at var opt rh, rh postgres call your version of postgres, lib pg sql data, and then I think I missed a log file there. I did. Uh, Tanya, could you take a note for me? I need to fix my slide. This needs to have a directory here called log so that I don't confuse people. Sure. Okay. So there's a couple of places to go look in Postgres. Journal control, you'll see the pulp failures. You'll see the, the logs that Postgres is showing. So you'll see some of what Postgres is putting out. You will not see the exact SQL because SQL doesn't write that to journal control. Um, you'll see the, the log messages that pulp is putting out. And what the journal control log will give you is the application context at which the deadlock happened. It's important to start with the exact error messages that are coming from Postgres and that are coming from the deadlock. But what's equally important is what happened in the 30 seconds leading up to this deadlock, because that will give you more uh, of a window, more of a context of, OK, this is the these are the things. These are what the workers were doing at the time. Oh, I see this worker was doing this thing and that worker was doing that thing. And it, those two tasks collide. And here's why. So it's important to get context for the deadlock in order to be able to start debugging the problem. Always, always, always start with the logs. Assuming that you know what's happening without actually looking at what we've just described here is going to waste a lot of time. I know this because I, I make that assumption, alas, all the time. And I lose literally days on occasion because I look at just the, the um, output in the uh, task that's failed which has the whole stack trace, and I go straight to the to our code in context stages or somewhere, look at the line that failed and go, oh, I know what's going on, and then I start working on fixing it. And because I didn't look at the SQL, and I didn't look at the other process that was involved, and I didn't look at journal control for context, I wasted literally days fixing the wrong problem. So always start with all the logs until you have a, a grasp on the context of where the problem is happening. Here's some sample output. Um, I hope this isn't too small, but this is this is just sample. Uh, at the top here, here's what a, a piece of a uh, task that has failed as the result of a deadlock problem in pulp. This is what it has. It has the description, which says deadlock detected. This detail here that you see, all the way from detail to the context, this is coming from the error that Postgres is throwing when it when it cuts the connection. So it says, hey, I have a process that's talking to me that's waiting for a share lock, there's that word, on a certain transaction. It's blocked by a different process. That different process is waiting for a share lock on, a, on its transaction, which is blocked by the first process. So there we see that deadly embrace of those two philosophers. Um, the error message even says, see the server log for query details. That means go to your Postgres output and look at what was actually going on. And it's giving you Postgres's idea of context, which is we're inserting into a package ID here. And then there's a whole traceback that, that 
is being delivered by the Python code as it logs this exception and then ends up failing the task. The Postgres output, and, and these actually, these error messages aren't all from the same, um, they're not all from the same event. They are all from actual problems that have been logged by actual users of Pulp. Um, if we look at Postgres, you're going to see very similar uh, output. Postgres says, hey, I had an error, deadlock detected. That's here. Here's my detail. Here's the, the actual SQL that was being run at the time that deadlock happened. In this particular one, we were doing inserts into core artifact. And it tells you what columns it was going to fill in. And then it has all the values that it was filling in. Uh, and here was what the other process was doing. Excuse me, it was doing at this point. Um, this all the values in a running production pulp system can be enormous because we batch, you know, uh, say the sync pipeline is batching 500 um, uh, content entities at a time. And so that's 500 artifacts in one line. So be prepared for these logs to be large and to do some editing to have them make sense to you. Um, and then the rest of this hint context and then statement are all the stuff that is being delivered back up to um, uh, Python and then logged at the uh, task level. If we look in journal control, again, we see in journal control the exact things that we're getting from the task error because pulp logs those to journal control and then sticks them in the task error message and then fails the tasks. So you're going to see the identical content here. What you're also going to get is context in front of that, which tells you what was going on at the time the deadlock happened. And I only have one line of that there. But these are the three primary places that you're going to start with to say, OK, now I've gotten all the data I can about this deadlock. Now I'm going to go to the traceback and start looking at the code. Any questions before I move on? Three, two. One, OK, good to go. All right, so a user has reported a deadlock. You've looked at the logs. You've looked at the code. And you want to reproduce it because you can't see how this code could possibly be causing that problem. How can I force a deadlock to happen? Often with what users report are large and often inconsistent reproducers. And if that's the only way you can make the deadlock happen, it greatly increases the cycle of trying to debug and fix the deadlock. So as an example, and this is, again, an actual user example, sync a 12,000 entity file repo, remote, if you will, into 15 different repos in pulp. In a clean pulp, by the way, your pulp has to have nothing in it simultaneously. And if you add the word immediate, because that's the other, another, uh, uh, in this particular case, a real world case, that means you have to wait for the actual network process of 12,000 artifacts to be synced 15 times all at the same time into your pulp instance. That takes a lot of time. And if every time, every path through, I'm going to add log output, I'm going to be in the debugger, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, experiment with the change. OK, now I have to clean out my pulp instance. Now I have to rerun that thing. I'm going to go away for 45 minutes and wait for it to be done. It can really increase the length of time it takes to fix the problem. So how do we force deadlock these uh, deadlock to happen artificially? And the answer is get creative. I mean, you're not just going to let pulp do its top level. I'm just going to run sync on this uh, repository and hope that it happens. You're going to force the code that you suspect as having the problem uh, to, to cause the problem. And you're going to use pulp core manager shell to write Python directly and try and force problems to happen. So here's an example, um, which actually comes from uh, an effort about a year ago where, let me back up to give folks some context. For orphan cleanup to work asynchronously, it has to know the last time objects were touched so that if you've touched a thing in the last 500 milliseconds, it doesn't inadvertently clean it up just because it hasn't yet been assigned to a repository. So that means as you're syncing objects, at the, we're going to uh, put everything into the database. And then we're going to touch everything that we just put in the database to say, hey, this was touched at this, at this millisecond. 
and we're going to hit all of them as a bulk operation because it's way more performant. And that ended up introducing deadlocks into the system. This, the examples I'm about to uh, execute here are from the investigation of how can we figure out what's going on and how can we fix it. All right. So first of all, this is a Python script um, that I'm going to execute in a moment inside of Pulpcore Manager Shell that is going to force deadlocks to happen. Uh, update timestamp is the thing that Touch was doing. So I basically, we went in and said, what is Touch doing? It's doing this job. Okay, let's experiment with doing what Touch is doing and seeing if we can force the same kind of deadlock to happen here. Um, and what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start up five threads and have all of them call update timestamp, this, this little process, this little method rather that we have up here. And then we're gonna wait for them to finish. And we're gonna do that three times because it didn't always happen in, in this debugging process. We would spin up five threads and it would work. And then we would spin up five threads and it would fail. So we're gonna run this whole thing uh, three times because what I tell you three times is true. So let me grab this failing uh, process here. Let me switch over to, can everybody see my terminal window? And is the font size okay? Yes. Okay, cool. So uh, we're going to go into Pulpcore Manager up here in the top window. There we go. Um, if you haven't used Pulpcore Manager, it's, um, it's the Django admin shell, if you will. But if you use Pulpcore Manager, it sets it up so it knows where uh, your Python path should be, and it finds all the pulp settings. And so it can talk to pulp and talk to the database and do all the stuff that you want to do from inside the pulp application. But you're in a shell where you can, you can um, just execute code. So uh, for example, because I'm using Pulpcore Manager, I can just say from plugin models, I'm going to want content and repository version. Those are pulp things. Um, and then I'm just going to do regular Python. Before I execute that, let's do this. So here I am looking at var lib pg sql data log postgresql Thursday, because that's today's log. That's the Postgres database log output. This example is not going to be logging to journal control because while we're using pulp objects in this code up here, we're not executing the uh, pulp task with all of the log warning and log error statements. So all we're going to get as log output here is going to come from inside the shell. And then we're going to see if Postgres doesn't like us for whatever reason. So let's uh, get this started. As you can see, I was doing stuff uh, was this, this morning. Yeah, this was. Actually, this was last night. No, I wasn't up at four in the morning. It's UTC. Um, forcing deadlocks because, you know, deadlocks are so much fun. I just like to see them go by. All right, so here I am watching the, the database logs at the bottom. I'm now going to execute my hopefully reproducer and go. And now this is working. And right away, you can see we're hitting the deadlocks. Sometimes we hit them. Sometimes we don't hit them. Uh, fortunately for this one, this is an e this one turned out to be easy to reproduce once we understood what was going on. So this, let's go up a little bit here. Here's the exception that we're getting at the Python level, and this is the, exactly the log app which you're going to see in your in your um, uh, worker in your st uh, task traceback with the whole traceback, and you'll note that we are going. Here's my update timestamp method. And then in this case, we're going right down into the guts of Django because um, I'm not running basically inside of a pulp task. So there's not a lot of pulp code here. There's just the code that I wrote that we're going right to. And it says, hey, here's where your problem is. Um, and it tells you some details. In the Postgres output, you can see that, let me see if I can find the best. So here we have a deadlock detected. Here it's telling us, the details, I have a, a 003 process that's waiting for 001, and I have a 001 process that's waiting for 003, and the 003 process is doing an update, and it's telling you exactly what the SQL is for, for folk that know how to read SQL. I'm doing an update on this table. I'm setting this field to this value where pulp ID is in, and I'm doing a select on all of the pulp ID. I'm even doing an order by here, and you'll note it didn't help. It didn't help because update order by is ignored in this the, in this particular configuration of uh, a SQL statement in Postgres. The order by does not order the uh, the update process. 
So you can see that this is the other uh, SQL that's being executed. It looks like it's doing the exact same thing. You see the word order and you're like, but I thought that would fix things. And yet it didn't. This is the, the joy, if you will, of working in um, deadlock land. Sometimes you can you can look at it, figure out what's going wrong, say, oh, I have to order this, do the ordering and it won't fix anything. And then, then you get to cry on everybody else's shoulder and rubber duck and we'll try and help. That was a failing example of uh, uh, trying to, well, actually, that was a successful test because it reproduced the deadlock in a way that now I could just run this all day and do lots of experiments. Right here in, um, in Pulp Core Manager Shell, until I fix the deadlock. Here is a very similar kind of thing. We're doing update timestamp. There's more here because one of the things I wanted to talk about a little bit is performance of deadlock fixes. So I'm doing some, um, I'm doing a bunch of lines here that really are just about gathering timing, but we're doing the same kind of thing that we were doing in the previous one. We're doing an update. What, we're, what we've discovered how to force the SQL to do the update in order. Um, just some context here. We first tried to do tried to do the uh, update ordering in that failed um, example. We thought that should work, and it didn't. And we opened a bug in Django saying, "Hey, this should work." And the Django folk very graciously pointed out, "Yeah, you didn't read the documentation close enough. This is how you need to do what you are trying to do." And we were very excited. We closed the issue as thank you for helping us fix ourselves took their advice, and then we wrote this code. So let me grab this. We're going to do the exact same thing that, hello, copy is good. The exact same thing we just did. I'm going to throw this into Pulp Core Manager shell. Now we're going to watch the Postgres output down here. Oh, look. I don't see any deadlocks happening. Hey. That was successful. So this is an example, a very compressed example of deadlock debugging. I found the code that was breaking, figured this line was the problem. I set up an artificial reproducer and then experimented until I could make the deadlock go away. Um, now, one thing about this example is you'll note that it took about 2.6 seconds for each of those updates to happen. There's, I've got 12,000, file objects in my database right now. So that's that's how many uh, objects we're updating at a time here. Um, that's kind of a lot. We didn't like that performance. We did a bunch of experimentation and reading and also discovered a thing here. One of the things that you can do in um, Django, because it's a thing you can do in Postgres, when you're doing this select for update, which says, I am about to update all these rows. So nobody else touch them. That's what we're doing here. You can say skip underscore locked equals true. Now, what that means is if somebody else has a lock on one of these rows, I'm going to ignore it. You don't have to lock it. It's OK. That works in this case because particularly in touch, all that matters is somebody somewhere is updating this row. If we don't get to set the timestamp, whoever has it is. So we're willing to let that pass. This is not a universally true thing but it is a, a tool to keep in the back of your head um, because the difference between the 2.6 seconds that we had with the first run and saying, if somebody else has this row locked, then we're just going to not bother with it is an order of magnitude. We went from 2.6 seconds to 239 milliseconds in order for that exact same operation. Fun things you learn while debugging deadlocks and thinking about SQL. If you if you skip the locked rows, uh, does the does Python know to go back and then update those once the lock is gone, or does it just completely no. skip them? What we're doing with this code, this is the Python code. So what we're saying here is the subquery here is going to return the way that that select for update works is it returns this query is going to return a list of um, content entities that were selected. So when you say skip locked equals true, it won't return the ones that were already locked by somebody else. And then this subquery is being passed into the filter right here. This right here is the magic that makes select for update work. You have to do the select for update as a subquery in the filter that you then pass to your update 
uh, request in Django. So if I have, if select for update would select 100 objects in, when it was the only thing running, then this update is going to hit 100 rows. In the context here where I'm running five different threads, maybe one of them, select for update, 80 of those rows are being affected by somebody else by the time thread five gets into it. So that there's only going to be 20 content objects that are selected, which means we, thread five, is only going to update 20 objects. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Outstanding. Yeah. Other questions? Um, I may add to this. Um, we can use skip locked here because we know that in the whole application, the only update we ever do to content is touching. So that's the way we know that when we don't get the lock, someone else is touching that thing, not that's, just updating it, but real touching it. That's a good observation, because if you change the content object, it's a different content object. Yes. Go ahead. If, if I may, so like um, one of the logical um, conclusions of that is like not only is content immutability um, like a rule of the road and pulp, like it's actually you can see like here's a subtle but very important way that that is kind of spread all across our database, like even down to the way that the locking is handled in yep. these deep SQL query statements. Um, and that's uh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Subtle but deep is a really good description of, honestly, probably 80% uh, of the problems one is going to be solving when one is handed a deadlock problem. Partially because all the gross, obvious, silly, we just did it wrong deadlock problems get hit in CI. They get hit by our tests. They get hit by the first time some user syncs three things at once. To my dismay, all of the easy deadlock fixes in pulp are long gone. All that's left are the hard ones and the subtle ones and the deep ones, just like this. All right. But next, Did I answer yeah. your question, David? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Standing. OK. All right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, we haven't even gotten to prevention yet. And here I am at almost out of time. Prevention. So how do you avoid deadlocks? So first of all, avoid operations on overlapping content. and and we do that pretty well. The task manager says, hey, somebody's using uh, repository X. Nobody else gets to use repository X. That means we avoid a whole class of deadlocks by doing that. Uh, consistently ordering of updates is really important. If you're going to do stuff in bulk, pre-locking bulk objects using select for update is the place where you have an opportunity to order the locks correctly. Another way to prevent it is by using the entire table locks. Don't do that. If I see code coming in in a PR that does that, you, we're going to have a talk. Um, because it ruins a concurrency, performance goes out the window, and you can make things worse. I heard a beep. Question? Um, yes, I have a question. Um, the ordering, do you need to order the tables you want to update to? So let's say first do the bulk on artifacts, then do the bulk on con um, content? If you're doing them, all in one transaction, then ordering all the things you're going to be touching in that tra in that transaction matters, and you want to do it consistently. Okay. Now, typically, deadlocks happen when you're running the same code in multiple threads. So, if you're consistent in that, you know, if that code locks things in an order, then by definition, it's consistent with every other instance of that code that's executing. The um, another deep subtle problem is when I'm doing a set of locking in my code. Your code far away that I don't know about is also updating those things at the same time for a different workflow, and we don't know about each other. Then you can end up ordering in one way. I order by pulp ID in one case, but I'm going to order by natural key in another case, and we're both going to hit the same, um, the same rows in the table at the same time, and one of us is going to have a deadlock problem. This is why globally saying there's no deadlocks in pulp is a thing I will never say, no matter how many of these we fix. Fun. Uh, so I have some specific code examples. Um, let's see. For, there are links here you can look at 
uh, for ways we have fixed actual deadlocks in pulp code with actual pull requests. The I'm only going to look at one of these for in the interest of time. Uh, this is the touch and ordering that we just looked at some uh, artificial recreations for. We made two attempts at this. Here's the first attempt that we made when we thought that you couldn't actually order select for update in Django. Um, this is how what we changed touch to do. And we went to a very low level and said, all right, we have to figure out um, all the IDs that we're going to be working on. So we get the value list of the, the bulk query uh, that we're going to be doing. We're going to make those into a string. We're going to find the database table that we're about to affect with this magic code. We're going to open our own connection. Go ahead. Sorry, can you hit Control plus a couple of times? Yes. How's that? Thank you. Way OK, back. cool. Um, we're, we have to find out which table we're operating on, because we know think, we're about to know things about SQL here that no Python programmer should have to know. Sorry. Um, we're going to go down and get the, the table itself. We're going to open our own connection to the database. We're going to start our own transaction. We're going to build a SQL statement by hand. And you can see we're going to update this table. We're going to set the timestamp where the ID is in. And here's our subquery that's going to do the, the select for update by ordering by pulp ID. And we have our skip locked in here because we'd already figured out that that made things faster and was acceptable. And then we're going to execute that directly against the database. How fun is that? The answer is it's not a lot of fun. Um, one of the things I do want to observe here is when you have found a fix for a deadlock, your code that you submit in a PR, if it's reviewed by me, is going to need to have comments roughly this verbose in all of it. Because six months from now, somebody, and it might be you, is going to look at all this code and go, why are we doing this? This is dumb. And they're going to change it, and the deadlock is going to come back. So be very, very verbose in your comments when you are doing stuff that is specifically for a deadlock. Because often, why you're doing what you're doing is not obvious. Um, so this is the this is an example, and this worked. This fixed the deadlock in touch. It was just ugly, and none of us were happy with it. I remember uh, uh, Brian and Dennis, the three of us, looking at this, going, "Ah, uh, all right. Well, we'll do it now. But God, hopefully Django fixes their stuff, and we can do something about this." Well, it turned out that Django didn't have to fix their stuff. We had to fix our stuff. This was we opened their is an issue. They responded. We were embarrassed. Mostly I was embarrassed. And then we fixed our code. So now let's look at touch. This is the whole thing. Now, that big, ugly SQL thing and all of that setup, it's all gone. Here's the subquery that you saw in our test, uh, our little test script. And here's me using the subquery to do an update. Done. The, de the deadlock for touch was fixed. All right, I'm not going to go over the other examples because I am almost out of time here. Uh, so let's talk about conclusions. Conclusions here. When you are coding, think about concurrency. Look at your code and say, yeah, but what if six different things are all trying to do the same thing at the same time? When you're testing, think about it even harder. Uh, I'm going to do a sync once in, in my new um, uh, content type. Oh, look, it worked. Good, I'm done. No, how about doing five all at the same time? because then you'll find the easy to fix deadlocks. If you're doing more than one thing at a time, order matters and it will cost you in performance. You're gonna pay a performance cost, whether it's in Python or whether you go all the way down to doing a default ordering in Postgres, you will pay a performance cost. We don't like performance costs, but we hate being wrong way worse. So yes, the ordering order matters. Yes, it'll cost you some time. It's still worth doing. Question? Not question. <clears throat> I was just uh, going to comment on the fact that I think we could use <clears throat> PyTest fixtures to simulate these really high concurrent um, situations. Yep. And I believe that we should definitely do that the next time we have to work on one. Absolutely. So that we can create uh, faster reproducers. They're still going to take some time. But they're going to be doing this network I/O all-in-one machine versus yeah. trying to sync down rel. 
you know. Well, and there are things that, you know, if you do a, a pie test fixture that has 30 entities in it and you write a test that is going to sync sync that fixture 10 times with 10. Part of the thing, though, is that your fixture, your test has to say, I need to make sure there are 10 workers running for this mm -hmm. test. Yeah, yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Exactly right. And I'm, and I'm um, not talking about uh, running these tests in our CI or anything, mm -hmm. but for setting up your own local reproducer, it would be really helpful. And then you're yes. in control of how many workers you have. You know? Exactly right. And you can you can you can check that in with a skip and say, maybe maybe that's a thing we want to do on a weekly basis. We want to run all of the really expensive, see if we can force a deadlock to happen tests. Um, but yes, have, building an initial framework for tests would be very helpful. Uh, next thing is anytime you're writing Python code and you see the word bulk in a method you're about to call immediately you should think this might deadlock because that means that at a very low level we are telling the database to do a lot of inserts or a lot of updates or even i don't know i don't think i've seen a deadlock involving deletes um but bulk is a big red flag think hard about that and be suspicious and the last conclusion is it is entirely okay to decide not to fix a deadlock you can look at code and say, you know, I can envision a time when this might deadlock, but it's such an edge case of an edge case of an edge case, and fixing it is going to be so non-performant, or it's so hard to tell whether we actually fixed it. Did we fix it? Did we make it worse? We can't tell because we can't reproduce this because it's so rare. It is okay to not fix a deadlock as long as you're very intentional about I'm not going to fix this. As long as you put something in the code that says this might deadlock, we're not going to fix it. And here's why. And you admit to yourself, but it's still a bug. It's still there. And at some point in the future, some user eventually is going to hit it. Question. Um, Grant, is it OK to think that as long as I'm not using bulk, I'm safe from the deadlocks? No, because you can be doing lots of things in one transaction, even if you're only doing them one at a time. And if that code is running in multiple threads, so I start transaction one, and now I'm going to do update row one, update row two, update row three, update row four. And the same code in thread two is running transaction two, and it decides I'd going to do this in a different order because I'm using a set and I have no idea what order they're coming out in. And I'm going to do five and then one and then four and then three. You can still have the transactions deadlock. I see. One I'm of just the other. Find a balance because you say, like, think about concurrency all the time, think harder when you're testing and write the code. So, how to find the balance uh, between, like, not thinking all the time about the deadlocks, not to get to the syndrome of the deadlock fearing you know yeah the 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 updates are way more dangerous than inserts right because the update means everybody knows that the row is there so it's accessible to other threads if you're doing an insert well nobody has seen that row yet and if you win on the insert then you are the one that knows about that row we do a lot of get or create and what the problem with that is that and that prevents us from getting the duplicate key violation of you and I both trying to create the same thing at the same time, and I fail because you created it first. I'm going to fail once and then go, oh, I just have to get get the one that you just created. Now we both are working on the same row, if you will. Um, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, so um, part of, so like the pattern is, yeah, the bulk updates, like that's clear. And that's because that one line of Python is actually in one SQL transaction executing a bunch of operations. Yes. And so then the other case is where it's easier to spot in code because you have the like explicit open transaction statement. Mm -hmm. And um, Django by default um, uses auto commit mode. So that means that every... There is a transaction. It's just that there's one operation in every um, line of Python. Ah, and so, ah, and so that's why. Jane, so so Postgres can always find an ordering in that case because yep. there's no two. There's no. There's no deadlock possibility because every action is a single operation, and Postgres can just reorder them and avoid the problem. So if you look for those places in the code where either you're doing a bulk update because that's multiple things in one transaction 
or you're using that with transaction atomic um, uh, idiom. I forget what that thing is called. Decorator. Context manager. Context, Context manager. manager. Um, Context that's manager. that's the place where you gotta be like, hmm, it could be here. Yes. Thank you, Brian. I, I and my apologies, Ina. I will blame the fact that I was up too late last night for forgetting <laughs> about the fact that auto commit is on in our instances. So yes, Brian is exactly correct. The with the with transaction atomic is the big red flag, and bulk is the other big red flag. Folks, um, I would like, if I may, interrupt you. Uh, We're having so much what? fun, Tanya. I know. <laughs> Can we move this fun to the end of the day when we have a free slot and we'll continue having fun? Yes, uh, exactly. We have a we have a David session coming, which is also an hour long and or oh, fifty minutes long, and we want to have probably a quick break before that. Um, yep. If it's okay. Yeah. Uh, I have. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much. And what I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go through questions. I don't care if you can always ask me questions about deadlocks. I don't guarantee to have your answer, but you always will have my sympathy. These are the links that are mentioned here. And thank you very much for listening to this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you folks.